and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. I would like to welcome back a guest that we had on the Path 11 podcast, if you can believe it, in May of 2017. I am bringing back Lisa Smart. It was episode 100, Decoding the Language of the Dying. If you would like to go back into the archives and listen to that um, interview after this one. Um, And she was doing some work and is doing work with Dr. Raymond Moody. And she said, gosh, if, if you'd like, have me on back with him and the three of us can can have a great discussion. So that's what this show is about today. Lisa is the author of Words at the Threshold, a linguist, educator, and poet, and she founded the Final Words Project, an ongoing study devoted to collecting and interpreting the mysterious language at the end of lives. And we would also like to welcome Dr. Raymond Moody, who is an award-winning author, a world-renowned scholar and researcher, a dynamic lecturer, an expert trainer and instructor, and featured expert in the media. If you're not familiar with his work, he is the best-selling author of 12 books, including Life After Life and Reunions, which have sold over 13 million copies worldwide. He also has authored numerous academic and professional articles on near-death experiences and the relationship of language to consciousness. Dr. Moody continues to draw enormous public interest with his groundbreaking works on the near-death experience and other transpersonal aspects of grief and the dying process. And I would like to welcome you both to our show today. Welcome, Dr. Moody and Lisa Smart. Thank you so much. It's always good to be with my friend, Lisa, and thank you so much for having us on your program. Yes, thank you. It's great to be here with Raymond and with you, of course. Yeah, so I would. I really kind of wanted to start, since we do have you both on, uh, just talking about how the two of you came together to begin to work on this project, the Final Words Project. I know, Lisa, you had reached out to Dr. Moody um, to really consult with him and, and work with him on a lot of the research that he has done. And um, I'm just going to give you guys the platform to go ahead and uh, talk about how this venture began. Why don't you begin, Raymond? Do you mind? Well, uh, sure. I um, I am known as the person who first brought near-death experiences to the public attention in 1975. But um, and I am a medical doctor and psychiatrist. But before that, I uh, got a PhD in philosophy, and and I was a philosophy professor. And in that connection as a philosophy student, I learned about near-death experiences, which Plato was very interested in these experiences. So that was in 1962. And uh, then in 1965, I heard an actual living human being, Dr. George Ritchie, who had had such an experience himself. And so I have interviewed thousands and thousands of people with near-death experiences. But I, my interest in philosophy had to do with logic and philosophy of language. And philosophy of language is about the concept of meaning and how things have meaning. And I had had a lifelong interest in nonsense. And hold on for a minute. I mean, like Dr. Seuss and Lewis. <laughs> and I had studied the different types of nonsense and written on this when I was a philosophy of language student at the University of Virginia, getting my PhD. So when I went to medical school year, years later, I began to notice that, as many any doctor can tell you, that patients who were sick with various kinds of illnesses, for example, delirium or um, intoxication with certain kinds of substances like ethylene gas or mercury or um, um, or people who are severely stressed, like when you see them in the emergency room and they're, they haven't been injured, but they just saw something that was so horrifying, they, they talk nonsense. And so what I, I know, and people who are psychotic, for example, schizophrenic, 
So what I noticed was that the that the types of nonsense that people talk involuntarily, like because of delirium or stress or intoxication or whatever, that they are the same types of nonsense that Dr. Seuss and Lewis Carroll and uh, Shel Silverstein, one of my favorites, um, write deliberately. So what I realized was that nonsense was nonsense, um, whether it's deliberate or voluntary. So, and I, I dealt a lot with terminal ill patients and began to notice that in the last few days or weeks or hours of life, people will start uh, talking nonsensically, but the the loved ones who are left behind around the bed say that, yeah, I knew it was nonsense even when um, when I when he was saying it, but I, I nonetheless they, they are touched by it. It touches them somehow in the back of their mind, and so so I was. Uh, um, have worked out how to think logically about things that don't make sense, namely <laughs> when you prepare somebody with that kind of knowledge and then they happen later on to have a near-death experience, they are enabled to talk about their experience in an entirely new way. So this is what I've been working on for long, many decades, I guess. I was in uh, at this uh, seminar I was doing um, for the uh, for a university, and among the students was this wonderful, smart linguist mm -hmm. named uh, Lisa Smart, who had recently observed with her father during his death process this very thing about the enigmatic language. So that's how we got together. I guess about what, Lisa, six or seven or eight years ago now? Yes, 2012 was when I attended that seminar. It's amazing it's been that long. Yeah, so over, yeah, just a little over six years, I imagine. Yeah, and or even more, because it was in May that I actually met you, 2012. And it's so amazing, because when I listen to Raymond's story and account and partly why I asked him go to go first was selfish because I really oftentimes I'm the one who starts uh, the story of how we met and I was genuinely curious to hear it from Raymond's perspective and what's so remarkable to me about it is how life works how two people are going on these two different trajectories or paths and then they intersect so I was teaching adults uh, how to read. Um, I had training in applied linguistics and worked with adults with dyslexia. I loved language. I loved understanding the connection between how our minds work and how language works and finding tools for people to be able to interact with printed material better. And I loved what I was doing. And um, so then January 25th, my 53rd birthday, my uh, father became very, very ill. And midnight uh, that night, he walked out the front door of my mother's home in Berkeley, California. I was living in Napa, California. He walked out the front door in his underwear. Now, this is a man with a PhD who before then was very lucid, um, never had problems so, you know, walking out the front door in his underwear before. And he walked down the street at midnight and when the police stopped him he said he was going to the big art show his wife's big art show and he was carrying boxes to the big event well of course my mother called me and she was very distressed about it and so was i he landed up in the hospital and that really initiated a three-week process in which he finally um, passed away because of complications related to an infection from being over radiated for um, prostate cancer. And when I heard his language, um, well, of course I was terrified because I was his daughter and he was always known for being very lucid, a uh, very bright gentleman. And so at that very moment, being a linguist, I thought, I wonder what's going on. I want to write down these words. And then through the next three weeks, I just recorded um, everything I heard 
And that began my curiosity about these mysterious words at end of life. And I know that later then went on and kind of propelled you into this we, uh, research and writing the book Words at the Threshold and, you know, getting all of the data that you have. And I want to go into that a little bit uh, further. But what I really find fascinating with the work that you guys are doing is that, you know, there's all these accounts, right? There's so many stories that people can tell who have sat at the bedside of a loved one who is dying. Um, yet it really feels like you guys are both trying to put this into some sort sort of like comprehensive thing that other people can begin to like hang on to. It's not really like a reference de desk, but you are giving it more structure uh, for us to understand what this language is about during this transition. So we can further maybe even explore more about the life after death process or really the, the transition of this. I kind of feel like you guys are giving us a brand new textbook or encyclopedia <laughs> of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great way of saying it. It's, um, you see, we are taught in our schooling to pay attention to the literal mode of language, right? Mm -hmm. And to a little bit of figures of speech, but mostly we just think in literal terms. But um, when people are talking on the, as they're dying, they don't talk literal language. But now we have an entirely new way of um, a grid, kind of, to to make sense of the different kinds of nonsensical and very figurative things people are saying as they are dying. And that's when I noticed, you know, after I transcribed everything my father said in those last three weeks, and it was packed with metaphor and packed with uh, what I would call nonsense. I couldn't make sense of it. When I looked at all that, I was curious about what ha what research had taken place in this field of the end of life language, because we know there's a lot that has been done with language acquisition in the beginning of life. And just synchronistically, um, a friend of my mother's was teaching with Raymond uh, during the seminar that he had mentioned. And it it just completely blew me away when I heard him on the fourth day of that seminar that um, he had done research into unintelligibility because as a linguist, there's almost been, as Raymond would call it, a nonsense taboo. Uh, there, you know, we've stayed away from taking nonsense seriously. So when I heard Raymond Moody talk about not only his work with near-death experiences, which of course was incredibly compelling, um, but also his very uh, diligent and thoughtful, careful analysis of nonsense. I was absolutely thrilled. And if we can together bring together the kind of encyclopedia that you mentioned, that or you know at least some beginning field guide or reference that it would, you know we would be just delighted to offer that kind of service to people. Yeah, and I, I don't know who would like to answer this question, um, maybe Dr. Moody for you, but is there any explanation uh, as to why, you know, as we're dying, we move from that literal to more maybe of the metaphor or the nonsense language? And because I know that there's a lot of debate out there, right, about, you know, people having near-death experiences. Is it really this experience or is it just the deterioration of the brain or certain chemicals that are released here and there? Um, and is there is there any way that we can make more sense of why this language begins to take place? Well, yes, we can. However, in order to do that, it is an entirely attainable goal. However, we have to go on a sort of long path of thinking to figure it out. But once we do, yes, yes there has been an absolute breakthrough, no doubt about it and the genuinely rational study of the afterlife question. Now we have entirely new ways to approach it. And in terms of the, the classical argument that you stated there, which is, is goes back to um, Plato and Democritus, the atomist, who had um, figured out that things are made of atoms. And, but both of them were interested in these near-death experiences. And Plato said, yeah, these experiences indicate there's an afterlife. <clears throat> but Democritus said, just like you were referring to there, 
that this is just the residual biological activity in the body, right? And we say today the oxygen deprivation to the brain. But the trouble with that is that it is, is very common that bystanders at the death of someone else, like somebody who's standing there at the bedside of grandma as she dies, or a friend, or, or and sometimes medical doctors and medical personnel as well, will say that as the person in the bed dies, the bystanders themselves have these very experiences that we identify as near-death experiences. They say that they get out of their body and go part way toward their toward this light with their dying loved one, or they say the room fills with light, all kind of just people say they see apparitions of the dying person's uh, uh, deceased relatives and friends coming in to sort of escort the dying person away. So the, since the bystanders are not ill or injured, there's no question of, of um, the oxygen deprivation to a brain, their brains causing this experience, but they have the identical experience. So something a lot more complicated is going on than oxygen deprivation to the brain. And um, what it is, we now have the ways to, because now we can actually reshape the mind before anything happens so that subsequently, years later perhaps, when um, somebody has a near-death experience, they'll be able to uh, describe it to us in a lot better terms. And in terms of your question, why people do this, I, um, when people have an experience that they find hard to put into meaningful words, sometimes they will resort to nonsense to do it. And a good example of that is synesthesia, which is the condition where the senses get mixed up and people will tell you, for example, that um, when they hear music, they see colors dancing around in front of their eyes so that the, the uh, sound perception uh, sense somehow causes a color sense. Or people say things like, um, this chicken tastes awful round today, like the tasting shapes and such, which is stuff that doesn't make sense to the rest of us, right? But so somebody who has synesthesia might have to say, um, your voice sounds crinkled and uh, yellow. <laughs> and, um, it, to the rest of us, it doesn't make any sense. But we can assume, I think, safely now that the people who are talking this kind of way are trying genuinely to describe some experience that that they just that doesn't it the rest of us can't imagine what it's like and Andrew Newberg, who calls himself a neurotheologist, he studies spirituality in the brain. It's a whole another look. And I feel like Raymond and my perspectives are complementary, um, is that he actually has looked at what parts of the brain are activated during mystical and spiritual experience. And what's interesting to me is those are the very parts of the brain that seem correlated to nonsense. And it, it's possible he and you know he has suggested in, um, that as we're dying, certain parts of the brain first give way, you know, and others maintain some sense. But it's like I believe consciousness is non-local, but it comes through certain parts of our brain possibly. These are all theories, and but the one one explanation is that those parts of the brain that are more associated with transcendental experience are also associated with nonsense, according to Newberg's work. And so that, I find that compelling also. There might be some real relationship between those things as well. Although I don't believe that consciousness is housed inside the brain, but it might be that consciousness is, um, it's like water pouring through a sieve. And um, so maybe a certain parts of our brains remain relatively, I don't know, engaged. Um, this, you know, the water pours through those channels. But I do not know anything medically, and Raymond obviously has that training. But those are some of the ideas that Andrew Newberg has shared with me as well. 
Yeah, and I, yeah. I would agree with that as I well. Like this the might person. be a little more uh, biased, uh, you know, conversation that we're having because I too believe that consciousness is non-local and is not stored in the brain. But as I'm sitting here listening to the both of you, I'm almost wondering if. Um, like the question that came to mind is what if, what if what you're trying to decode here and what if the language of the dying is the actual language of consciousness, <laughs> you know, that because, you know, like Raymond, you had said, like, sometimes we can speak so literal, but when you think about what you have found in your research with the different type of language that's happening here is metaphor, repetition, the non, uh, referential language and the nonsense, um, you know, what, what if this is the real language of consciousness? Nonsense is consciousness raising. <laughs> There's all kinds of specific examples of this. The, the Christians have the, um, the glossolalia, for example, right. speaking in tongues. And um, what that is linguistically, it's a mishmash of nonsense syllables drawn from the speaker's own language put together in a way that avoids gra grammar or meaning. And um, when, once you get started on that, you don't need an ecstatic state to start it. But once you do, once you start it, you can go into an ecstatic state. It's really remarkable. And koans, for example, very uh, consciousness raising, where questions like, um, what is the ha sound of one hand clapping, right? And so, um, there are many spiritual modalities all over the world which use nonsense to um, to heighten consciousness. And this is a very, very, it's part of the shaman songs that shamans sang these lengthy verbal productions that were combinations of uh, nonsense syllables and meaningless refrains together with uh, meaningful parts so that the combination was more powerful than either alone, which sounds so abstract until you start thinking of doo-wop music, right? <laughs> so, -na 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 -na, -na 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 -na, get a job. It's the same organizational principle. And when I was a professor at East Carolina University from 1969 to 72, I used to take a little portable record player and stack of records like <laughs> 45s, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, mm -hmm. one of the ones was uh, Flying Home that she, and uh, non just nonsense syllables, and those uh, doo-wop records. And since I was standing at the front of the, the uh, class, I noticed that different patterns of the the way the nonsense was related to the meaningful parts would affect the students in different ways. It's, I mean, it's very remarkable once you once you see it in a group, you'll never forget it. You can see these uh, commonalities of the effects of different patterns of nonsense. And you can imagine when I heard Raymond Moody share this at the seminar, I became so inspired because I had heard nonsensical language from my father, and it was very despairing to me. And Raymond offered a way to look at it that was much more, well, just as I mentioned, inspirational and, and gave me another way to look at what I saw and was puzzled by. It's very exciting work, I think. Yeah, and I, it was an, another article that I think I was reading that you had wrote, Lisa, about that even though uh, with all of the um, stories that you have collected, that you can also find a little bit of a theme. And one of the articles you were talking about when the dying begins to mention water, that there's something that is happening there. So can you talk a little bit about like what you're finding in the themes and what you're connecting with that? Let's say, yeah, you're the first person who asked me about the water, but it does seem um, I had a, a fair amount. I want to say maybe about a dozen, which is you know was this, uh, significant enough to notice it. People talking about the change in weather, so that was one, and often had to 
to do with rain or storms, which is very metaphorical, like because there's something going on in in my natural condition that is changing significantly. So people talked a lot about rain. People talked about water. I mean, you think of the whole myth of the river Styx and you know what water represents in terms of representing boundaries between the worlds, but also taking us to new places. Um, so water did emerge for people, and also the s- storms and rain emerged. But one of the parts of the language of the dying is not only the nonsensical, but the metaphoric. And uh, the weather um, was oftentimes an indication that people were nearing the threshold, that they were getting closer to dying as the weather conditions changed. And yeah. you know, there's a long tradition in Japan, going back literally hundreds of years of um, death poetry. And, and that is that um, there was a custom and tradition that just before a poet died, he would write, he or she would write their death poems. And these are beautiful. And uh, water is a very big theme in them. And, um, you know, in Japan, there's a custom to give water to people mm. when on the verge of death. Is yeah. I forgot the name of the custom, but it's uh, there's a word that means something like death water. It's the water that mm. you give people in the last little bit of their lives. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I we uh, my when my aunt was on her deathbed, we kind of had a funny uh funny moment with water or ice chips because you know how they say, well, you can't oh, give yeah. them too much, and she's like, please just give me some water, uh, and we're like, well, we're really not supposed to. She goes, well, what's the worst that's gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> we just had like a a good laugh about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I found that to be you know interesting, and thanks for um sharing that, Raymond, because I I wasn't familiar with that that tradition is what they would do. It's one of those things that is not transmitted in every culture, but it appears in every culture. And the way I got hooked on this was uh, my favorite book is um, Plato's Phaedo, which I read in October or November of 1962. I was 18 years old and it's completely changed my life. And it begins with it's the day of Socrates' death, and what he's doing on the day he dies is he's writing songs and poems, and he he talks about how this is, um, he co- compares it to swan songs, that just before swans died, the Greeks believe, they made the most beautiful songs of all. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's a very, uh, many, many cultures, this is something that's truly transcultural. Yeah, and so Lisa, it's been two years. I can't even believe it since we've yeah. talked. But um, so uh, what what has been happening over these past two years? You know, since the book has come out, uh, you know, you guys have the the website up, finalwordsproject.org. You have the place where people can share their stories. And I remember saying, well, you know, what's your next book going to be? And I think there was something we were talking about where you know you, there's probably even more information to collect. So I'd love to hear how you and Raymond have been working together um, over the past two years with all this. That's great. Well, I'm glad to hear that what I projected two years ago has actually happened. <laughs> and that's great. Um, so what, you know, a lot of the last two years has been focused on getting the word out and communicating with more people, you know, doing presentations um, and also collecting more data. And I'm, you've, you've, you're speaking with me at a really important juncture because um, this article came out about 10 days ago in the Atlantic magazine so that the work that I'm doing got much more recognition. And from that, um, in just these 10 days, the database has almost doubled. Can you believe wow. it? Wow. Well, I had I think I had 10, oh, close to 11,000 hits on my website, and I'm so grateful for people who contributed their stories. And also, one thing that happened is part of the challenge for me with this research, first, I was incredibly, incredibly blessed to have been working with Raymond, and um, and partly, I was so grateful 
grateful for Raymond, not just because of who he is, but there was no academic institution that was comfortable working with me on this research at the time because of a lot of the ethical considerations. And I had the old style linguist model, like let's put tape recorders near their bed. You know, right. <laughs> you know I didn't, I didn't really, and Raymond kind of looked at me at the time when I said that and was like, well, there may be other approaches. Raymond's been wa very wise and very, <laughs> very um, supportive through this process. So I learned quickly that it wasn't going to be with digital recorders, or at least in this iteration of collecting data. But on my website, I have a way that people can share their experiences anecdotally. I do ask questions about meds. I do get their um, consent, of course. And so we have a lot of data. So when this article came out through The Atlantic, um, it was mentioned that I was looking for an academic home for this research, and I had a hard time finding one. So two schools, and one of them at Stanford, um, contacted me and said they might be interested in working with me. So I'm very excited because what it means is I can take well, – I have more data now, and I, and I want to use the next – uh, year to really go back and look at it. Now that I've you know, wrote words to the threshold, I came up with some early findings. I, I applied much of what I learned from Raymond on hit based on his decades of work on unintelligibility. But now I have an opportunity using the incredible software that's out there that can do this linguistic analysis, you know, like quickly. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward next year to take this work to the next level and possibly, possibly, um, you know, with at some academic home where I can use the kind of resources that I can't afford. I, I, the software I was looking at is $15,000. You know? wow. there's, there's no way that a former school teacher could ever afford that. But of course, in an academic institution, they would have this kinds of thing. So that's partly it. I'm also have become really interested in getting more cross-linguistic. I've gotten some from other countries as my book has gone out to more countries around the world. But I would also at some point really love to look at what's happening in other languages and where there are um, similarities as well as differences. Yeah, that would be important, I think, too. And one other thing <laughs> is Raymond and I have just had the most uh, delightful time in the last six months. We launched something called the University of Heaven. And, um, you know, Raymond, who is uh, in his 70s now, it's harder and harder for him to travel these days. And uh, we wanted to bring his work to people. He has such a rich, uh, rich career. He has so much wisdom. So we have brought it to this online platform called the University of Heaven, where we're offering classes. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, now, have so much fun with that. We've interviewed uh, a lot of people who've had near-death experiences and um, doctors who've studied them. We've talked to Evan Alexander. Um, we are, um, we've talked to Dr. Melvin Morse, who studied the near-death experiences of kids. And um, so we're and coming up this coming Tuesday, which is February something. Um, we have a great program with a um, wonderful scientist who has studied um, uh, psychedelic e experiences and their relationship to near-death experiences. And is, is that with um, Rachel Harris? Yes. yes. Yes, yes. I believe we spoke with her as well um, with uh, ayahuasca and all that. Yeah, fascinating. And um, you can get all of the, I mean, all of the programs are still there. And um, I, for years, I've been thinking there needs to be some sort of responsible forum for um, talking about near-death experiences, because it's something that has captivated people for well over 2,500 years now. And, uh, and as we all know, there is a lot of kind of misinformation out there. And um, so... Um, I'm, I'm just really good, happy that we have this uh, forum. The University of Heaven dot com is how you <laughs> reach us. Yeah, I'm on the website now. Looks great. And, you know, Dr. Raymond, you've been just in this field for so long. You've seen it progress uh, throughout the years. What type of like coaching or recommendations do you give to Lisa now that if she does have this platform at the university, like what do you feel has been missing uh, with this research? Or, you know, is there, is there something 
that she can, you know, that you would recommend that she goes into even further in the work that has never been done before? Well, we're kind of, we're working together on this, and I what I think, this is my opinion. <clears throat> I think that um, when people say something like, "Oh, the near death experience can give a scientific evidence of an afterlife," well, those people are very well meaning, and a lot of these are my dear <laughs> friends. Um, but in the real world, in 2019. The question of life after death is simply not a scientific question. That is the reality of it. And, and the, diff, the reason is that there is no clear way to verify sentences like there is life after death. We can't even imagine what it would take to verify them. And this idea about things that they couldn't possibly have known, right? Like the, the medium told me things that they couldn't possibly have known. Well, if you begin to think through that with any depth at all, you quickly see that, that it's not real, it's not a real criterion. And so the real deal is that we don't yet have a, a clear cut enough meaning to the sentences like there's life after death to describe clear cut ways of verifying them. So before there is a scientific breakthrough, there has to be a conceptual breakthrough. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, what I am saying is that I have made the conceptual breakthrough, not to pat myself on the back or express an ideology, but just to say that over the years I've worked on this, it will soon be published by Llewellyn Publishers. It's called Making Sense of Nonsense. And the subtitle is something like how to use unintelligible language to, you know, answer the big questions of existence or something like that. And so we do now have ways actually to reformat our mind and to add new rational principles so that we can think about this in entirely new ways. And it's as though now we can send people over there armed with a new set of principles and new mental faculties that will enable them to come back and to tell us about it in a brand new way. And by the way, that has happened. It was um, back in October of 2015, I got a call from a man who had been through one of my seminars some years before where you learned to talk, think about nonsense logically. He's a very distinguished scientist and artist. And he told me that he had a, uh, he was just terribly ill and he had three cardiac arrest and near-death experiences during his hospitalization and said specifically that when he was over on the other side, his mind went back to the nonsense seminar I'd done, and he said, I understood what you're saying is true. But, and he was a, sci a scientist, so this is the way he said it. He said that you can't comprehend how that world is connected with this world unless, he said, unless you take the unintelligibility axis into account. So we can actually now reformat our mind to think logically about this. And we are on the verge, I think, of real new breakthroughs on how to think about life after death. Yeah, I think so, too. And, uh, you know, another thought that just came to mind as you were saying that as this word gets out, right? So um, I'm in my 40s. Hopefully I have some good years left here, too. But, <laughs> um, you know, when so, you know, now I'm being exposed to this and I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about, you know, the conversations that I had with my deceased loved ones. But it also can do something for those of us who are living, understanding it and then bringing it to our own deathbeds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, you're in your 40s. I'll, I'll say that I just hear this all the time. It's like when people get in their 40s and 50s and 60s, especially if they've had a, a sort of very busy life, of, uh, often in business and, you know, working hard in their business. And then they get to a certain point in life and then the idea of an afterlife comes back to them with a kind of urgency. And um, and see, this is what Plato is all about. That is the theme of Plato's Republic, is what happens to an old guy who's 
been very successful in his business, but then he, when he gets old, elderly, he suddenly starts thinking about, oh my gosh, this afterlife thing. So that is what the Republic is all about, is that very problem, and it's something I saw in my psychiatry career. This was just a very common thing, people in their 60s and 70s coming in with these kind of concerns. Right. So you're early, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm early. I've been pretty busy myself, too. But, you know, I just I think it's kind of, uh, you know, it's interesting and, and cool, too, because if you bring your friends and family along this journey and also like expose them to this and have conversations while we're lively and alive, you know, who knows the type of conversations that we could all be having like 20, 40 years in the future with with the information that you're putting out there now. And, you know, to answer your question, also to follow up with everything that, that he, Raymond has said, is definitely part of, you know, when we ask people for data, people, even though we ask for nonsense, that our filter is so strong that when people often are with their loved ones, on one hand, what Raymond said has absolutely been my experience also, that when people hear nonsense, on some level, they hear and read between the lines, like right? They find ways to make sense of that language. But on the other side of that, oftentimes when people hear nonsense, they really don't believe me <laughs> when I say, can you write it down and send it in? You know, there's such a sense that if it doesn't make sense in the way we think of sense, people don't transcribe and share the language. So for me, one of the things that Raymond has throughout my time of working with him continued me to focus on is, yes, the stuff that makes sense, like when people talk about angels in the room or when people speak in these metaphors, that's important, absolutely. But really, let's you know, keep working on collecting that fascinating, you know, the fascinating puzzling language, because there are patterns, as Raymond has discerned, in that, ling in that language. So, you know, my big prayer and hope for the coming years is that people will become as you are talking about, more and more comfortable with nonsense and seeing it as much a part of human language. It's as much a part of language as sensical language is. You know, we know that, as Raymond mentioned, because Shel Silverstein, Dr. Seuss, these folks sold millions of books, right? And that was that that's the real deal, right? People are responding in real ways to nonsense. So for me in the future, I'm I'm hoping that more and more people will be comfortable with language that doesn't make sense on the surface and that we can get more of that data and we can begin to look at it and see what we can learn about cognition and consciousness from it. Yeah. And, you know, both of your works have been invaluable to me and especially our interview, Lisa, back in 2017, because I have offered, you know, this our conversation to my clients who were going through the grieving process or, you know, working with a loved one that was transitioning to dying. And what I found was it also, it shifted something in their grief uh, process mm -hmm. because it made them become a little more present just by offering mm -hmm. the suggestion of saying, Hey, why don't you just take a listen to this conversation? Why don't you read this book? Why don't you have a journal, you know, when you go and you visit your father and, and, you know, some of this stuff may happen. What if you recorded it? There might be some messages there for you. And what I found with my clients who took those suggestions, they all of a sudden had much more of an interactive relationship mm -hmm. with the person uh. who was dying and they became much more present. It wasn't like they uh. were just kind of sitting in a room by somebody that's dying and just kind of being there, but not being there, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I do feel maybe in Maybe even the Western culture, I think we're getting better at understanding death and being with people who are dying. But I also feel that this lends to a much more interactive and very present, uh, you know, being in the moment experience with those who are transitioning. Oh, I'm so delighted to hear my work is going out in that way. Thank you so much. I'm so yes. delighted yes. for our work because Raymond's been such an important part of it. Yeah. Yes. Well, any last any last words before we uh, wrap last this conversation words. up? <laughs> <laughs> any any last nonsense? Any more nonsense yeah. that you'd like you know, to share I'm, before I'm we end? Thinking people who are interested in this kind of stuff, which we all obviously are, 
often don't have very much money. So what we are doing at the universityofheaven.com is we're trying to make our programs very affordable for people like us. And I'm on for this because I just want to get the word out. But the universityofheaven.com, go there and just take a look at our programs and courses and see what you think. And scholarships are available, too. <laughs> we do offer scholarships. <laughs> and we will go ahead and put uh, the universityofheaven.com in the show notes so uh, people can um, click on that and visit that. And, you know, this was just an honor. It was really great to speak to you both. And um, thank you so much for your time. And Dr. Raymond Moody, thank you so much for all the work that, you've, that you're doing. It was an honor to be able to speak to you. And, uh, you know, come on back uh, when you have that other book that's coming out. Love to... Um, <laughs> Love to have you back on the podcast. And Lisa, keep in touch with us because I can't wait to hear what may happen if one of these universities picks this up and you get to really do the research uh, with all the equipment that you need. Uh, I'm excited. I'm very excited for you both. Thank you. What a lovely interview. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. All right, guys. Take care. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Path 11 podcast today. I hope you all enjoyed this show. And if you haven't checked out our Patreon page, I'd like you to do so because we are going to start putting some content over there that is only for our Patreon subscribers. You can get content for as little as donating a dollar a month, and it could just be a one-time donation. We have other freebies over there that you can get depending upon how much you would like to donate. And again, it could be a one-time donation, or you can continue to keep your subscription on a monthly basis at that donation level, but I just put my MBT immersive experience, which was a four day, four day intensive meditation training in Tennessee with physicist Tom Campbell. I was listening to binaural beats, going to altered states of consciousness, having out of body experiences and life changing experiences that I was able to bring back uh, for myself, for my clients, for my friends that was just out of this world. So if you would like to listen to that, I'd like you to head on over to path11podcast.com. You're going to see an orange button that says Patreon. Become a Patreon today and you can have access to that podcast. And I would like to remind you to head on over to path11productions.com and check out the membership that we have for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. We have over 25 hours of footage with amazing speakers like William Buhlman, Thomas John, Terry Daniel, Suzanne Geisman, Suzanne Northrup, Linda Fitch, uh, Austin Wells, just a few people Uh, to name off that were amazing. These workshops are just so valuable. So I think that you would really enjoy it. It's also a great thing to think about to maybe give the gift to somebody who is struggling with grief. If you are looking for resources, this is a great conference to send people to to check out. And thanks again for listening today. (music) 